Welcome to the NTEB Radio Bible Study with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Grider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good evening, everybody. Happy Wednesday, and welcome to this edition of Rightly Dividing. My name is Jeff Greider. I am the editor-in-chief of NowTheEndBegins.com, and tonight, for the next two hours, I have the honor and the privilege of being your radio host and Bible teacher. Tonight, we present to you a short history of the shed blood from Genesis to Revelation as found within the pages of your King James Bible. You know, I spent some time this week battling with the Bible-deficient followers of John MacArthur over on Twitter. What was the subject of this latest skirmish? The shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, John MacArthur places no importance of any kind on the shed blood of God at all. And in fact, he enjoys mocking the people who do. And I'm going to play that audio clip for you tonight uh, so you don't think I'm slandering anybody. As a result, nearly 100% of MacArthur's followers, with blessed few exceptions, also lightly regard the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. How important is that blood? Why, it's only the payment for your sin, that's all. Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. On this episode of Rightly Dividing, we start with the very first shedding of blood as found in Genesis 4.10, take you all up to Paul's revelation of the shed blood of Jesus as the payment for our sins on the cross, and clear on through to Revelation, where God is giving the armies of Antichrist blood to drink in Revelation 16.6. Your King James Bible is a book that, on the inside, is filled with shed blood, and it's a book that, on the outside, men gave their lives in order for it to be printed. The true currency of the book is blood, and it is spent plenty throughout the many pages of the Bible. You have a choice. You can stay ignorant like John MacArthur about the blood of God, or you can come with us as we open up the pages of our inspired scripture. Is the King James Bible inspired? Well, go to 2 Timothy 3.16 and you tell me as we open up the pages of our inspired scripture to see the blood from God's perspective. And I promise you, you will never look at blood or the Bible in the same way ever again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, Father God, all these that are here. And um, Lord, we just commit this time to you. We thank you. We praise you. And uh, we ask you to lead us and guide us. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for the shed blood. Uh, Well, welcome, everybody. Glad that you are here tonight. Um, Genesis 4.10 is the first time that human blood was shed. But um, just one chapter earlier, when God made the coats of skin, Uh, for Adam and Eve. Uh, That took some shed blood as well. And um, one was animal blood, one was human blood. And you know what? Those two go side by side all the way from Genesis 3 to Revelation 19. And uh, we're going to look at that tonight. And we're going to look at the blood. And um, this isn't a a horror movie. It's not going to be scary. But we're going to look at blood the way that God looks at blood. And um, there's a reason why theologians like John MacArthur have no regard at all for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you might say that I'm slandering MacArthur. 
Well, I'm going to play an audio clip of John MacArthur in just a little bit, and you tell me if I have reported correctly or if um, I am slandering. And uh, we don't slander. We don't besmirch. Uh, we tell the truth is what we do. And uh, if we make a mistake, we are happy to admit that mistake. Um, but uh, we do not slander people. So everything that you're going to hear about John MacArthur tonight um, is true. And I'm going to prove that to you. Um, please keep in your prayers the family of Bob Lieb. Um, a lot of you know him. Some of you do not know him. Uh, Bob Lieb, uh, I have been friends with Pastor Bob, or Dr. Bob, as we say, um, and he has a ministry on Facebook called Boaz Baptist, and um, I first connected with him way back in the early days of Now the End Begins, and uh, he kind of took me under his wing. Uh, he, he was about 10 years older than me. Uh, but Bob Lieb went home to be with the Lord yesterday, and so we are glad for him. He was not in good health, and um, it's a blessing on one hand that he has gone home to, to be with the Lord, uh, but on the other hand, he leaves behind loved ones and a family and lots of friends who miss him, and so please keep the family, the wife and children of Dr. Bob, in your prayers. And um, they started, his son started a GoFundMe. And um, I donated to it. And if God puts on your heart to, um, to donate to that for his family, that's really what it's for. And, um, you know, if the Lord leads you, that's great. If he doesn't, that's fine, too. There's no pressure. Um, but Bob Lieb was a good guy. He was a Bible believer. He was an old-fashioned Bible believer. And um, him and I had our differences over the years. Um, but uh, we both loved the book. We both agreed on Bible doctrine. Absolutely, 100%. And so please keep the family of Dr. Bob Lieb in your prayers. And uh, like I said, he went home to be with the Lord yesterday. And uh, he, he was with Now the End Begins from the very beginning, all the way back like in 2010. And um, I've had some great conversations with him. I got to meet him one time. And um, uh, he was just a good, good guy. He loved the Lord, absolutely loved the Lord. He was a Jewish believer, and um, he really liked to get into the book, and you could have some great conversations with him. So there it is, Dr. Bob Lieb. He's home with the Lord. Please pray for his children, for his family, and if God puts on your heart to donate to his GoFundMe, then please do so. Uh, if you're just tuning in tonight, we are talking about the blood. And uh, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a different perspective tonight. Um, we, you know, look, we stick with the book. We walk in the old paths, but we we like to mix it up from time to time. So um, I don't know about you, but I'm sh I sure am glad for the blood tonight. I sure am glad that that blood was shed for me as a payment for my sin. And uh, we're going to be talking about that tonight. Once I wondered in sin's black there was no way to make my To the Lord did cry, he is a sinner, and now he must die. Then I heard a voice say, Father, I'll go, and I'll pay his sin debt in power.
It's still the blood that cleanses within From the highest star in heaven To the depths of the sea It is still the blood of Jesus That brings victory to me There are those who Some men count on the times they play through, but when the battle's over and victory is won, I'll go home through the blood of the Father's only Son, and it's still the blood that saves from sin. It's still the blood. That brings victory to me And it's still the blood That saves from sin It's still the blood That cleanses within From the highest star in heaven To the depths of the sea It is still the blood of Jesus That brings me
remind you of that to rob you of your joy now that you're saved. I remember one such day I was going by a place way down back yonder down memory lane. The old devil said, I remember when you was there. I remember what you remember what you did right there. You know who you you know who you was hanging with there? And I had to admit, I said, Yeah, I remember that devil. And that day, I didn't let him do all the talking, though. Hey, hey, hey. I said, I remember all of that. But there's one thing, only one thing I can say to you about it. Hey, it it's under the yes, blood. Hey, hey, hey. Hope this song will be a blessing. Hey, hey. of long ago oh Satan came right by my side making me feel low he brought up thoughts of hurt and pain when I had gone astray he wanted to discourage me as I walked along my way he said you're undeserving cause I know where you've been I have a record of your life when you were bound by sin. I know your darkest secrets that you would never tell. What makes you think you don't deserve a place with me in hell? Well, I heard the old accuser, and this was my reply. You're right for all the things I've done. I sure deserve to die. My righteousness is filthy rags. My goodness is unclean. There's only one thing I can say to what you said to me. It's under the blood. Oh, praise His dear name. I'm not what I used to be. My life's been changed. Now shackled by sin and shame. It's already gone. I'm happy reminding Him. It's under the blood. Oh, yes, it is. I'm glad it is. I like this. Holy name. Victory was given me when I was born again. He was my stained and sinful past and put me life with him. No longer do I bear the mark that sin had to rub my way. With happiness and peace of God, praise God now can say it's time to go.
The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 2, 13, But now in Christ Jesus ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Colossians 1, 20, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. First Peter 1, 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. If you're just tuning in tonight, we are going to go through some of the shed blood that we see all through the Bible. Your King James Bible is a bloody book. And without that blood, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. But not just any blood. The Bible says that it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. And the only, the only one who can redeem you with perfect, spotless, sinless blood is the only person who has perfect, spotless, sinless blood. You know what the Bible says in Acts chapter 20? And uh, if you think I'm a modalist, uh, this will drive you crazy, but that's okay. Uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 28. 
Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased, who? God, with his own blood. The, the blood that Jesus shed on the cross is God's blood. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. In Jesus, the fullness of the Godhead dwells. And um, that blood that was shed, people say, well, God's a spirit. He doesn't have blood. Well, why don't you tell that to Luke? And maybe he has time to go back and update Acts twenty twenty eight, But I don't think he will. Uh, because God absolutely has blood. Uh, Cheryl is asking uh, what a modalist is. A modalist um, is somebody who believes that there's only Jesus Christ. And uh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of all of the Godhead. I believe that, as the Bible says, that Jesus is God the Father in human form. Uh, but I also believe, I also believe that God can separate himself into the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, but there is one God, <laughs> and one faith, and one baptism, and one blood. And we're talking about that blood tonight. And uh, I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, we're going to go pretty deep in the Bible tonight, so... If you've been waiting for a Bible study when we're going to do um, a little less scripture, uh, that's not tonight. <laughs> uh, we're going to do a lot of scripture tonight, and you have to. The Bible says that we have to compare scripture with scripture. Um, well, we are just about ready to go into our prayer time, and so if we're going to play one more song, if you have a prayer request or a praise report, um, please post that into the chat room. And if you're listening, but somehow you can't find the chat room, all you have to do is simply go to ntebradio.com. Oh, I'm 
glad it's still there. The soul yes, of that living God yes, bring the floods of endless questions yes, yes, and doubts that fuel my mind with a fear that ripped my troubled soul brought me back to my knees in prayer. Oh, yes. Her right Father, will you please look and see if the body is still there and he says, now don't you worry, for the blood is there to stay. Amen. Blood, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the shed blood. Thank you, Father God, for that payment that was made on my behalf. The payment that set me free, Lord. And uh, I thank you so much for the shed blood. And tonight, Father God, we just pray that you would lead us and guide us into all truth in your word. As we talk about your blood tonight, Father God, open our eyes and our spiritual uh, uh, hearts and and uh, let us truly understand from your word the importance of that blood father god tonight we pray for anetta and um i had an update on her condition she's getting better so please continue to pray for anetta she had a stroke last year but she's fighting she believes in jesus christ and um she says she's getting better and uh, she's going to walk. She, um, <laughs> I'm naming it and claiming it. Uh, the Lord's healing her, so please keep her in your prayers. Robert Wiley is battling ALS disease. We're praying for him and his wife, Lisa. Um, ladies who are expecting, Elena Blackburn, Kelsey Emerson, Aaron Riddle, Gary Tatterson's daughter, Kayla. Um, and we're praying that God would just keep his hand on those babies and those moms and those fathers and uh, just watch over everything. Uh, Jeanette's cousin Andrew had a stroke and we're praying for him. Rob Beatty's colon cancer has come back and we're praying for him. Uh, Marcy Long, she um, uh, waiting for a report from the doctor on how the chemotherapy did for her cancer. So please keep Marcy Long, in, that's Dina's mom, uh, Mark Saxa would like prayers for his son Joseph to return to the Lord. Uh, Harmon's son Michael and Craig Arford uh, battling pancreatic cancer. Clayton Perry dealing with the side effects of chemotherapy. Um, Aaron Riddle's sister Tracy has metastatic breast cancer. Jill Puckett needs prayer. She's losing her vision. Uh, Matt is in urgent need of prayer. Um, Sarah Shine wants prayer for her children, Nicole, Sherry, and Scott, and for her health as well. She says, I listen to your broadcasts almost every day, and I've been so blessed by this ministry. Amen. Carol Jane is in the hospital uh, until the end of this month. We're praying for her. Uh, CJ's mom needs to get saved. Maddie Luck is battling Luli body dementia. Aunt Nancy uh, would like us to continue to pray for Brandon and Michelle for salvation. Um, Amanda says that her and Mike have an unspoken prayer, but I think that was COVID. Not sure. Um, but uh, she said in the chat room that they have beat COVID. And uh, that's a praise report. Rebecca Lynn is asking for prayer for her friend, Joel Smith, who is not saved and had a massive stroke. Um, 
Dave's girlfriend, Jill, is awaiting heart valve replacement surgery. Please keep her in your prayers that it would all go well and that the Lord would give her comfort and courage. Kevin Thompson, uh, this is one of my favorite prayers. He uh, He asks prayer for finances, a lawsuit, career change, and gospel track success. I just like this. That, that covers so many things. Angela's mom for healing and salvation. Deborah Shular, uh, we're praying for her for health issues after catching a parasite. Charlton's wife, Debbie, in five days from today, March 20th, having eye surgery. Please pray for Charlton and his wife, Debbie. Yasmina, Uh, Please pray for my daughter's uh, godfather in the hospital with lung cancer. We're praying for Leslie with a financial situation. Uh, We're praying that God would reorder the steps of her. um, Well, the Lord knows what it is. Uh, Just just keep Leslie in your prayers um, that God would overcome for her this situation. Uh, Scott and Debbie Lyman, please pray that the Lord will move us to Florida. Um, Julie Baird, uh, she has COVID. And uh, if somebody could give me an update on Julie Baird, that would be great. Um, Catherine Martino, please add my nephew Stephen to the prayer list. He suffered a sudden cardiac arrest while swimming and is in grave condition. So many young people with cardiac problems. I wonder what that could be. The La Piana family has an unspoken prayer request. Uh, Jeanette, Marie C., Adrian P. Breda, Chris Hart has half of an unspoken prayer request. Um, Regina has an unspoken prayer request. And baby Ezekiel is home. Oh, no. Yes, baby Ezekiel. He was born as a preemie a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. Um, And his granddad, Steve, says he is doing much better and looking good. So we're excited about baby Ezekiel going home. Uh, Regina Danner, today was day two for Jennifer's second comp test. She's upset and crying. Prayers to give her peace tonight and bolster her for tomorrow's test. Um... So please pray for Regina Danner's daughter, Jennifer. Uh, Rob says, prayer request for my friend Mike with multiple sclerosis, having a hard time with everything now. Berta Crab, um, sciatica pain is less and legs are working. Praise report. Uh, please keep Gail comfort in your prayers. Um, she works at the bookstore. And she's been having some muscle leg pain problem uh, really bad. I mean, in a lot of pain. So please keep Gail comfort in your prayers um, for healing. Blaine says, please remember my housing. It's going to happen. Amen. Um, uh, Amanda, I am on the mend and as feisty as ever. Uh, Amen. Katie says, praise report, my father finally accepted Jesus as his Savior. The good Lord has answered my mom's and my prayers and fasting, and we are so grateful. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Nightwatch Audist, unspoken prayer for me, please. Sarah R., um, friend with a late-stage colon cancer at the liver, her and family and husband strength for days ahead. Uh, April says, I have a praise report. I was working with a dog named Umbreon Sunday before last. Um, The first day she growled at me, so I threw a treat, and then she went for a walk with me. Uh, Gradually, the growling got less, and uh, she was actually jumping up and down and let me put a leash on her. Uh, I was worried about her when I first met her. They are not at a no-kill shelter. And April has a uh, heart for the animals, and she volunteers at a shelter. Uh, And that is a praise report. Amen. Julie Baird and her friend Katie are still very, very sick with COVID. And uh, that can be absolutely debilitating. So uh, please remember Julie Baird and her friend Katie. Um, Also, also... um, 
uh, Julie has been praying for Katie's salvation. So please remember um, Katie in your prayers for salvation. Heavenly Father, for all these prayers and for the unspoken prayers of our hearts, we ask you to work and move as only you can. We ask you to heal where a healing is, is required and needed. We ask you to restore and um, order and reorder steps that have been taken, Father God, and work out everything for your glory, for our good. And Father God, we just throw ourselves at your feet. And God, again, I'll say this on every broadcast. I'm so glad that we are a praying people. And um, I don't know of any other podcast, any other online Bible study that prays as much as we do. And uh, I'm not bragging, but I'm bragging on you, God, uh, that you have made us and put on our hearts to be a praying people. And I firmly believe that is one major reason why you bless this ministry the way that you do and why you expand us and, and, and you do all these things. Um, and, and, and we're glad, we're grateful. So please hear our prayers tonight. Receive them, Father God. Wash us clean yet again in your shed blood. And, uh, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, as is our custom, um, we like to, when one of us has a birthday, we wish them a happy birthday. So tonight, you've got to wish me a happy birthday. <laughs> And I just want to say thank you to so many of you um, that have wished me a happy birthday today and wished me a happy um, uh, born-again birthday yesterday. And yesterday was my born-again birthday. And I did an article where, um, in big, bold letters, I got saved with a free Bible from a free Bible program. And um, isn't that something? Uh, God leads me to salvation 32 years ago yesterday, and he uses a free Bible from a free Bible program for me to get saved. And then all those, then 28 years later, 28 years later, he gives me a ministry and gives me a, a free Bible program back in 2018. And um, here we are. Um, over 120,000 King James Bibles, New Testaments, and Scripture portions. Um, we had so many requests for free Bibles this week. And um, uh, the chaplain from the Union Correctional Institution in Central Florida, he wrote to me, and I read his email yesterday. Uh, chaplain Scott said, I am one of the chaplains here at Union Correctional Institution. It's a mixed population facility housing everything from death row, general population to confinement population, and even a work camp. And Chaplain Scott says, I was referred to your ministry from a friend of mine and believe it could be a huge blessing as the King James Bible is probably the most requested but the least donated Bible. And uh, he said, could you send us 150 Bibles? Uh, we sent him 200 Bibles, and that order is processing right now. Um, uh, also today, we sent out 50 Ruckman Reference Bibles 
by way of Oregon to go to Canada to a group of people that are called the Hutterite clan. And uh, it is dozens and dozens and dozens of people. And the vast majority of these people all have the last name, the same last name. And um, the one guy called Lorianne at the bookstore and said, hey, we listen to your Bible studies all the time. We are so blessed by the ministry. Could you send us 50 Ruckman reference Bibles? Well, Absolutely, and we started processing that order this afternoon. And uh, I'll get to the Bible study in just a minute, but but um, I really just want to take a moment. Um, oh, Heath is asking me, how old am I? I am 62 years young today, 62 years. I was born March 15th, 1961, and I was born again on March 14th, 1991. Um, So I just wanted to take out a moment. Do you realize that because of your prayer and your giving and your support, we can just say yes when the requests come in? That's how strong your praying and your support of this ministry has been. And Lori Ann's going to put a link into the chat room. Um, please pray for this ministry. Uh, and if God puts on your heart to donate, please do that as well. You can go to nowtheendbegins.com and click on the donate button. Uh, Lori Ann's going to put a link into the chat room, uh, the three different ways that you can donate. Um, but we are so glad and so grateful for your support. Um, and look, 50 Ruckman reference Bibles and shipping all the way to Portland, Oregon. Um, That's expensive, (laughs) but we're doing it. And so far, we have not turned down any requests for Bibles. We have been able to say yes to every single Bible request, large and small, that we have had. And again... It is the Lord working through each and every one of you, Um, your prayers, your support, uh, everything, giving, finances, the whole thing. And um, we have been doing the free Bible thing for four years, and we have never said no, no matter how many Bibles that they've asked for. So I just wanted to give you that update, but please pray for the Hutterite clan up in Canada. And um, uh, it's a blessing that that many Bibles, Ruckman reference Bibles, are going up to the Hutterites. And, um, you know, it amazes me the reach that God has given us all across Europe, Canada, South America, in all 50 states, Middle East, um, Africa, South Africa, Uganda, Zimbabwe, Um, New Zealand, Australia, God has given us an open door in 142 different countries on the face of the earth. Uh, And we are headed towards 1 million Bibles. Absolutely. We we have passed 120,000. And um, uh, that blows my mind. It blows my mind. Um, but so please continue to pray for our free Bible program and Bibles behind bars. Um, all right. And with that, let's get started with our Bible study tonight. Um, let me just play this clip. Uh, let me just play that this clip from John MacArthur. And I said a number of things about him. And I'm just going to repeat what I said because I want you to listen to what MacArthur thinks of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I said at the start of this program, and I stand by everything I say, John MacArthur places no importance of any kind on the shed blood of God at all. And in fact, he enjoys mocking the people that do take a listen 
to John MacArthur denying the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In your Hebrew commentary, you state that we are redeemed, quote, not by his bleeding, but by his dying. Do you still stand by that and why? Yeah, wouldn't, we're not saved by his bleeding because it uh, wouldn't have done any good if he just bled. This was a big controversy years ago. People, uh, some people who were enemies of me decided to fabricate all kinds of strange things, and we got kicked off 55 radio stations, and all because they said I denied the blood of Christ. Uh, well, look, if Jesus had just bled, nobody would be saved. Um, the wages of sin is not bleeding. The wages of sin is death. And uh, people must understand that it's not the bleeding of Jesus and it's not the blood of Jesus. To speak of the blood of the cross, the blood of the cross, is to simply speak of the efficacious, substitutionary, sacrificial death of Christ. Liar. Do I think he had to, to, to actually die, uh, actually bleed? No, not to save us but to fulfill the Old Testament picture. Somebody suggested that I might have thought he could be bludgeoned to death. Well, I suppose if God had decided that's the way he would die, it would be fine. But the pattern and the picture of the shedding of blood was in the whole Old Testament sacrificial system. And as the fulfillment of the final lamb, he fit that model and that pattern. But we are not saved by his blood. There's a Did you hear what he just said? We are not saved by his blood. That's what he just said. There's a weird theology that floats around that people have the turn the blood into a fetish, and they actually believe that, and then I've dealt, tried to deal with this with some people who accuse me of denying the blood, that somehow God collected all the actual blood of Jesus, collected it all around the foot of the cross, put it in a bowl and took it to heaven, and it's up in heaven sitting on a mercy seat, and every time somebody's saved, it's dumped out and recollected and then dumped out again and recollected. Of course, this is wacky kind of theology. Um, there's nothing magic in Jesus' blood. I mean, So, John MacArthur, you've heard him say so far that we are not saved by his blood. Um... There is no magic in his blood. Um, what does he think of the blood? Not very much. Just, I mean, try to think that through, right? There's nothing magic in his blood or his saliva or any other part of the fluids of the human body. I don't even... So, John MacArthur just made the blood of God on the same level with human saliva, spit, sweat, and any other type of... Uh, excretion that you could have. I don't know whether that makes me want to laugh, cry, or get violently angry. Uh, that That is such a ridiculous statement. To get too graphic here, I mean, what, what, what we're talking about is his death. And blood is a euphemistic way to refer to his death, particularly when you realize the, the bloodshed that occurred there. So he says that the shed blood is a euphemistic way to refer to his death. All right, so let's go to Google and let's define what a euphemism is. So Google define e -U -P, euphemism, a mild or indirect word or expression substituted for one considered to be too harsh or too blunt when referring to something unpleasant or embarrassing. That's what John MacArthur thinks of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. So I'm, I'm not saying anything different than Orthodox Christianity has said for its entire history. We are not saved by his bleeding or by his blood as a fluid, but by his death. So there you have John MacArthur. He just told you, and he said it five separate times. That clip is two minutes and 49 seconds long. He said five separate times that we are not saved by his blood. 
That's what John MacArthur believes. That's what he teaches. He denies the blood of Jesus Christ. There is no doubt about it. And he talks out of both sides of his mouth at the same time. John MacArthur absolutely denies the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He just told you five times in two and a half minutes that we are not saved by his blood. So you know what song we have to play now. And when we come back, I'm going to show you everything you ever wanted to know about the shed blood from Genesis to Revelation. We'll be right back after this. If you're just tuning in, you've got here just in time. We're going to look at a short history of the shed blood from Genesis to Revelation as found within the pages of your King James Bible. And uh, we're going to jump around a lot tonight. Uh, Let's go all the way back to the book of Genesis and uh, let's see what we can find there. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, and let's look down in, um, 
verse 8, Genesis 4, 8. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he says, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Hmm. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy, bro- thy brother's blood from thy hand. So, uh, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 10, we see the world's first murderer. Now, in the New Testament, in um, John chapter 8, verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. So, um, Abel is a type of Jesus Christ. Cain is a type of Antichrist. And right from the very beginning, what do we see? We see that it is about the blood. It is absolutely about the blood. And there's a reason for that. Turn to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. Hmm. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Isn't that interesting? John MacArthur said that we're not saved by his blood, we're saved by his death. But that's not what the Bible says. Now, these animals in the Old Testament, did they, in order to shed their blood, did they have to die? They absolutely did. But they were dying with a purpose. Their death did not make the atonement. The death did not make the payment in Leviticus chapter 17. What makes the payment? Not the death of the animal or the death of the person. The the thing that makes the payment, the thing that God will accept, is the blood. And I'll read Leviticus 17, 11 one more time. For the life of the flesh is in the blood And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. And underline this, for it is the blood, not the death. It is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So, um, going all the way back to the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The first murderer is also a type of Antichrist. And what he does is he sheds the blood of a type of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says that that blood has the ability to cry out from the ground. Genesis 4.10 says, The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. These are the souls that are under the altar. And take a look at what happens under the altar. Revelation chapter 6. These are the tribulation saints that are dying for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 6 starting in verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood, not our death, 
Dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season unto their fellow servants also, and their brethren that should be killed as they were, should be fulfilled. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. If you're just tuning in, we're talking about the importance of the blood from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, Genesis chapter 1, and uh, this is how you know that the book of Revelation is also addressed to the church in parts. Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, uh, no, Revelation 1, verses 4 through 6, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins by his own death. Mm, No. And washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Um, Amen. So we see the importance of the blood. The blood is a payment. So... um. Let's just pull off to the side just for a moment. The thing that you have to understand about when Jesus went to the cross. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Acts 20, 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. Now, just like in the Old Testament, the animal had to die for the blood to be applied. But it was not the death of the animal that made the payment. It was the blood that was shed when the animal died. Leviticus 17 says, For it is the blood, verse 11, that maketh an atonement for the souls. And if you want an atonement for your soul, you've got to have blood. But not just any type of blood. We're not in the Old Testament. We're not under the law. Turn to Exodus chapter 30. Turn to Exodus chapter 30, and let's take a look at what uh, we find there. Exodus chapter 30, and let's look down around verse 10. Exodus 30, verse 10. And Aaron shall make an atonement upon the horns of it once a year with the blood of the sin offering of atonements. Once in the year shall he make atonement upon it throughout your generations. It is most holy unto the Lord. What is most holy unto the Lord in Exodus 30, verse 10? The blood of the sin offering. That is what is most holy unto the Lord. But now Hebrews chapter 10. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Paul says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? 
because that the worshipers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. Now, in the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats was a type picture of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But I've already given you close to half a dozen verses already that show you that the sacrifice that God accepts, it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. Now, um, we're still in Hebrews chapter 10. Let's look at... um, uh, uh, Verse 6, Hebrews 10, 6. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God, talking about Jesus Christ. Above when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. God took away the temple sacrifice so he could establish the actual sacrifice that would be done by Jesus Christ. Turn to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And let's start reading uh, in verse 45. Matthew 27, verse 45. Jesus on the cross. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Some of them that stood there when they heard that said, This man calleth for Elias. And straightway one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. The rest said, Let be, let us see whether Elias will come to save him. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks did rent. Now, in other Gospels, uh, it is right around this time that Jesus says, It is finished. Going back to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now, what did he offer up when he offered up his body on the cross? He offered up the blood of God. Now, you might say, God is doesn't have blood. The Bible says God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that is true. That is absolutely true. But turn to Acts chapter 20. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Um, And let's take a look at what blood was in the body of Jesus Christ. This is another one of those secret doctrines that none of the Greek and Hebrew scholars um, seem to be able to get a handle on. That's because they don't have the King James Bible. That's one reason. Uh, Acts chapter 20, uh, verse 25 through 28. Acts 20, 25 through 28. And I know I'm going a little fast, but we have so much ground to cover.
Uh, Acts 20, verse 25. And now, behold, I know that ye all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, comma, underline it, write it down, highlight it, put stars next to it, have arrows pointing to it, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, if you know anything about sentence structure, if you know anything about sixth grade English, who is that passage talking about? Um, the passage is talking about the church of God. That is the context. That's the subject. The church of God, which he, God, hath purchased with his, God, with his own blood. Acts 20.28 20, is talking about the church of God, which God purchased or created with his own blood. Now, didn't Jesus go to the cross? He absolutely did. How is it possible then that it was God's blood that was shed on the cross? Well, first of all, that's what the passage says. So we start there. Second of all, Let's take a look at who Jesus Christ really is. Turn to Colossians chapter 2. You want to see why this blood is so important? You want to see why I get so riled up about this topic? Colossians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. Paul says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him, Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, Jesus Christ, which is the head of all principality and power. So, Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, that in the body of Jesus Christ is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one place, in one body. Now, you know what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ? Have you ever looked at the verses? 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. Actually, let's do um, 14 through 17. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 through 17. But their minds were blinded. He's talking about the Greek and Hebrew scholars. But their minds were, he's actually talking about the Jewish people, but you get the idea. But their minds were blinded, John MacArthur, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, the Lord Jesus is that Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So, don't get mad at me and don't, don't, don't call me a modalist. Paul says that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one and the same. Now, turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. 
Paul says this, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Whose blood? God's blood. Where is it? It's in the body of Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? The Bible says that God is a spirit, talking about God the Father. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Bible also says that Jesus Christ is the image, meaning something that you can see, touch, and handle. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, talking about God the Father. Are you starting to see why the blood is so important? Are you starting to see that that blood, does it blow your mind even a tiny bit that in the body of Jesus Christ, God the Father was on the cross? When's the last time you had a a sermon in your church that was preached about God the Father in the body of Jesus Christ? shedding his blood on the cross. Well, all those verses that I just gave you, Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God, and in him all the fullness of the Godhead dwells. Now, is that just talk? Is that just Paul, just blah, blah, blah? Or is that Bible truth? Well, obviously, it's Bible truth. But if we believe what Paul said, and we like to say that we are rightly dividing dispensationally true Bible believers, well, Colossians 2.8, for in him all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. All of it is in one person, So, and I've used this example before, if you could sit down tomorrow at Dunkin' Donuts and have a cup of coffee with Jesus Christ, and you sat across the table, and you looked into his eyes, God the Father would be looking back at you. Now, that's only possible if Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10 is true. That's only possible if Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 through 15 is true. Now, if those verses aren't true, then you don't have to worry about a thing that I'm saying. But if those verses are true, 1 Timothy 3.16 And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Who was manifest in the flesh, Paul? If you could just repeat that for me one more time. Um, Because I just, I don't know. There's something in me, Paul, that won't accept that. Could you say it a little slower, Paul? Who was manifest in the flesh? God? God the Father? Is that what you're saying, Paul? That's exactly what Paul is saying. How about this? Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4. Deuteronomy 32, verses 3 and 4. Because I will publish the name of the Lord. That's all capital letters. That's Jehovah God. That's the Father. Because I will publish the name of the Lord. Ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock. 
Deuteronomy 32 is talking about the father. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. Now, keep your finger in Deuteronomy 32 and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses uh, 1 through 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat. Watch it. Verse 4, 1 Corinthians 10, and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. I thought that Deuteronomy 32 verses 3 and 4 said that God the Father, Jehovah, is our rock. Are you starting to see it? Let me know in the chat room if I'm making this clear. Are you starting to see why the blood is so important? It's a payment for the blood is the for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. It is the blood. It is the blood. It is the blood. And it is the blood of God the Father in human form. Now, do I believe that God exists in three parts? The Father, the only begotten Son, and the Holy Spirit? I absolutely do. Do I believe that they all come together in the body of Jesus Christ? I absolutely do. Now, can I explain that? No, I can't explain it. Other than to say that I agree with the Apostle Paul when he says all those verses about how Jesus Christ is God the Father in a human body. That's not my doctrine. That's Paul's doctrine. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. Don't call me a modalist. I believe in the triune nature of God. I believe that God is one, one God and one Lord, and he can separate himself into three parts. But when you have Jesus Christ standing in front of you, you have God the Father in a human body with the Holy Spirit. Because that's what the Bible declares to be true if what Paul is telling you is true. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 16. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. The same Paul that tells you that Jesus is God the Father in human form. Now, you may not like that. That may go against your seminary training. That may not agree with the Westcott and Hort New Testament. But Peter has a warning for you. 2 Peter 3.16 As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in the which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as in wrestle, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. The Apostle Paul says Peter had some things to write about that were hard to be understood. 
And they are hard to be understood if you're not a Bible believer. If you're not a Bible believer, you're going to think that Paul's a heretic. But I'm telling you, the Apostle Paul, he's our apostle. His doctrine is our doctrine for the church age. And Paul says that Jesus Christ is God the Father in the flesh. And you know what? I believe it. When we get back, we are going to continue our look at the shed blood from Genesis to Revelation. Amen, um, <laughs> amen, amen. That was Oh God, I Love You by a group called The Bishops um, back in 1985. And you know what? That song has just really, really, really grown on me. It really, really has. It really, really has. Um, all right, we are back for the last half hour of tonight's Bible study. Um We're talking about the shed blood, and uh, we've been in Genesis, we've been to Revelation, we've been all through the Torah, Uh, we have made about a dozen different stops checking in with um, the Gospels and the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter, and we are just bouncing all over the place, Um, but we're bouncing all over the place with a purpose, with a direction. Uh, we, We are not vagabonds. Um, Moses calls Cain a vagabond and that, that means that he's just wandering with, with no place to go. And, uh, truly he had no place to go, but down. Um, but, uh, we are not vagabonds. We are strangers and pilgrims. That's what the Bible says that we are, um, uh, Hebrews eleven thirteen. these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Uh, Peter says in first Peter two eleven, 
Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, uh, that whereas they may speak of you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Um, so we're talking about blood. We're talking about blood. And the Bible says that the life is in the blood. Um, turn to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And let's look down at verse... 21, and we're going to go down to uh, 24. Exodus 12, 21 through 24. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin, and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood on the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And then Moses said, And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. Now, it is the blood, it is the blood, it is the blood. Now, did that lamb have to be slain? It absolutely did. But it was not the death of the lamb that the angel of death was looking for on the doorposts. It was the blood. Now, I want you to think of the death of Jesus on the cross as the delivery vehicle. If you buy something on Amazon and you're waiting for your package to be delivered and you see that gray and blue van pull up in front of your house, you get all excited, not because of the van, but because what is inside the van, that the van is used as a delivery mechanism to bring the package that you've been waiting for to you. Now, that package cannot arrive by itself. It has to be delivered in something. So, God decreed that Jesus Christ would have his own blood. And when he was crucified, died on the cross, Paul says that, our gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the Scriptures. And what do the Scriptures show you? That Jesus made a payment on the cross. His death was the vehicle that delivered the payment. So, when John MacArthur, um, turn to Genesis chapter 3. When John MacArthur looks at the death of Jesus on the cross, he only sees the death. He doesn't care about the blood. And the reason why he doesn't care about the blood, according to his own testimony, and that's why I played that clip, the reason why he doesn't care about the blood is he's not a Bible believer. He has the Legacy Standard Bible. He has the New American Standard Bible. He has the, I think he switched to the NIV about 30 years ago. And when John MacArthur looks at the death of Jesus Christ on the cross, he does not see the payment. All he sees is the death. But the death, 
was the vehicle that delivered the payment. And I think I have already given you more than enough verses to show that that is true. Uh, and I've shown you that in about four different dispensations. Uh, Genesis 3.17. No, not 17. Um, Genesis uh, 3.21. Genesis 3.21 Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Now, um, we really don't have time to go into this tonight. But we have done multiple Bible studies on what was the forbidden fruit in the Bible. And uh, if you have been here for any length of time, you know that. Uh, and I think the last study that we did was about six months ago. Um, and we showed you that uh, it is highly likely that the forbidden fruit in the Bible uh, was grapes, red grapes. Um, and when you look at the vow of a Nazarite, the vow of a Nazarite, uh, turn to Numbers chapter 6. Turn to Numbers chapter 6. You know, there's only one fruit in the entire Bible that is forbidden. And it was grapes, to anybody who took the vow of a Nazarite. Uh, the Bible calls him Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, Numbers 6 1. Numbers 6 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to vow a vow of a Nazarite, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink and shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink. Neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes nor eat moist grapes or dried. Um, all the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree from the kernels even to the husks. So, um, uh, maybe sometime in the uh, next two or three weeks, we'll do a Bible study on where did Adam and Eve get their blood from. And uh, that would take about 90 minutes to do that study. And um, there's some fascinating connections uh, between blood and grapes and grapes are the only forbidden fruit in the Bible, um, if you're a Nazarite. And um, Jesus had the vow of a Nazarite. And that's why he didn't cut his hair. Uh, because um, uh, if you had the vow of a Nazarite, um, you, you were commanded to not cut your hair. No razor could come upon your head. And um, it's funny, that was one of the articles that Bob Lieb, and we mentioned at the start of this Bible study tonight that uh, uh, Dr. Bob Lieb from Boaz Baptist Chronicles has gone home to be with the Lord. Um, but back in 2015, we published an article written um, by Dr. Bob, and it was entitled, Did Jesus Have Long Hair? And um, we said that the answer may shock and astound you. So we'll do a Bible study um, in the next couple of weeks on grapes, wine, the forbidden fruit, and where did Adam and Eve get their blood from. And um, that will be a really fun study. 
So we will go into that in detail in the next couple of weeks. Um, All right. All right. We still have time. If you have any questions about what we've been talking about, feel free to post your question into the chat room. And I understand um, we have covered so much ground tonight, and I gave you so many scriptures. If there's anything that you are not sure about, please just post your question, and I'll be happy to take a shot at it. Um, But look, that blood is the Father's blood. Luke says, quoting Paul in Acts 20, 28, that it was God's blood that made the payment. And it's only God's blood that could make that payment. Um, Numbers 35, 33. Turn to Numbers 35, 33. This was the qualification in the Old Testament about somebody who shed somebody else's blood. Numbers 35, 33. So ye shall not pollute the land wherein ye are, for blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. You see what Numbers 35, 33 says? If you have a turn and turn to Acts chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 16. Numbers Numbers 35, 33 says, the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. And that's why in the Old Testament, uh, there was no temple sacrifice for murder. Um, Because the only way that that could be satisfied, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And if you killed somebody, well, you had to be killed. And that was the only way in the Old Testament that that could be satisfied. But I want to show you something that's going to take place in the Great Tribulation. Revelation 16, verse 1. Revelation 16, verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. You see what's happening? During the Great Tribulation, God is going to unleash a blood flood. And there's a reason. Revelation 16, 5. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O God which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. And look at that next verse, Revelation 16, 6. Now, I want you to keep in the back of your mind all the way back to Cain killing Abel, all the way back to Leviticus, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. And Numbers 35, 33. And the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. Look at Revelation sixteen six, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. You know what God's going to do in the the great tribulation, God is going to give a blood flood. You can't drink blood and live. 
For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink. For they are worthy, because this is what they deserve. And it is all about the blood. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where God um, killed the lamb to make coats of skin for Adam and Eve, where Cain shed the blood of Abel, Cain a type of Antichrist, Abel a type of Jesus Christ. And that blood was shed 6,000 years ago. And you get to Revelation chapter 16. You think God has forgotten that it's all about the blood? No, no, no. Turn to Revelation 19. Turn to Revelation 19. Let's start in verse 11. Revelation 19, 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And him that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed in a vesture that was dipped in blood. This is not metaphorical. This is not a type picture. Jesus is wearing a garment that is dripping in the blood of his enemies. And the armies which were in heaven followed him. Oh, and it says verse 13, and his name is called the word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Winepress. What do you put into a winepress? You put grapes into a winepress. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings in all capital letters, and Lord of Lords. He is the Father in human form. Now, he treads the winepress. Turn to um, uh, Isaiah 63. Turn to Isaiah 63, verse 3. Isaiah, no, let's start in verse 1. Isaiah 63, verse 1. We're talking about grapes. We're talking about a wine press. We're talking about blood. Isaiah 63, 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments? What are they dyed with? Blood. With dyed garments from Bozrah. This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. Why? For the day of vengeance, time of Jacob's trouble, for the day of vengeance is in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. The Bible says it is all about the blood, the blood, the blood. And this is what Jesus is doing. He is trampling his enemies and he is splattering their blood on his body as a witness and as a testimony. That's what Jesus Christ is doing. Now, the Bible says, um, that 
there's going to be so much blood that it's going to be as high as the horse's bridles. Can you imagine how much blood that that is? That is enough blood that you could swim in. That is an unbelievable amount of blood. And it's going to stink. And it's going to have all sorts of nastiness. And all sorts of just terrible things connected with it. So, we have three minutes left. It's about the blood. Nowhere do I see in any dispensation that it's about the death without the blood. The death is the vehicle. Jesus Christ died on the cross, but he died to make a payment. If you take, if you take that payment away, his death doesn't pay for your sin. If you take the payment out of the equation, his death does not make a payment for your sin. Revelation 14, 20, And the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse bridles, by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. Um, That's going to be blood as far as the eye can see. It's about the blood. And this is why I get so mad at false teachers like John MacArthur because they teach lies and John MacArthur doesn't care anything at all about the blood of Jesus Christ he absolutely denies the blood he's a heretic he is a heretic without that shed blood you have nothing the death of Jesus Christ does not benefit you at all if you don't receive the payment that he made for you on the cross that day. And tonight I, I played all those songs about save by the blood and it's still the blood and the blood shall save. Why do people write so many songs about the shed blood of Jesus Christ? You want to know why? They write those songs because they are redeemed. They write those songs because they have been saved by the blood of the crucified one. Not just simply by his death. His death was the vehicle by which he made the payment. And that payment was the only payment that God would accept. His own blood shed for you. That when you receive that payment... Your sins are forgiven because a payment has been made. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, and we thank you for all these that you've gathered here. And um, God, we thank you for just a wonderful time in your word tonight. And um, Lord, I just pray that this Bible study will go forth um, and uh, it will be shared by thousands of people um, because people need to hear. They need to hear about the blood, about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And Father God, we thank you for that blood. We thank you that it was shed for for our sins, for my sin. It's personal, Father God. It's absolutely personal. And Lord, we pray uh, if there's one listening tonight, just one more soul, Lord, just one more soul. And we just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you, everybody, for tuning in and being part of our NTEB Bible study. And Lord willing, we'll see you back here Friday, noon Eastern time, for another uh, Prophecy News podcast. Have a great rest of your week, everybody.
The singers are tired The church as we know it Is losing its fire And some are discouraged From bearing the load But we must determine To keep pressing on Cause it's just one more soul And singers go sing And laymen keep sharing That Jesus is King The angels have gathered They're surrounding the throne And they'll start rejoicing For just one more soul Cause it's just one more 